afternoon. As president-elect of the original Cedar Rapids Rotary Club, I now call this meeting to order. My name is John Wast. I'm the chief operating officer of Tallgrass Business Resources. Tallgrass is a company that works on office furniture, office space planning, office supplies in Cedar Rapids, Coralville, and Davenport. I want to thank you all for coming today to help us celebrate Martin Luther King Day and also want to be sure to welcome all of our students that are being honored today and their families. This is what it's all about and I'm pleased to be able to welcome you for that. I would like to take a minute to have any public official, elected officials that are in the room, please stand so we can recognize you. I'll take a minute just to give you a brief background on Rotary. For those that do not know, Rotary is the first service club that was created. Rotary was started in 1905 by a man by the name of Paul Harris, a Chicago lawyer who also happens to be a University of Iowa grad. Um, it was called Rotary because they rotated between the members' businesses, which is where they met. Today we have 1.2 million members in 32,000 clubs in 200 countries around the world. Our international convention every year attracts over 30,000 people to that convention. Our local club, the downtown Cedar Rapids Rotary Club, was founded in 1914. We have had a history of local involvement for years and years, going back to things like band uniforms for the old Washington High School, to cabins at Camp Wapsie when it was created. A little newer, we've been uh, buying and installing playground equipment for Title I schools for a number of years. Our international projects include a water well in Tanzania and health care for the Yucatan, Mexico area. Lately, our latest project has been the capstone gift to the Nubo uh, market. We are the 34th largest club in the world, currently over 350 members in downtown Cedar Rapids. Enough about us, let's get on with the program. For our invocation today, Jerry Matchett. Good afternoon. As we enter into a time of prayer, I would like to take this uh, time to remember Drew Wall, a Kennedy High School student who died just this fall. And Drew was a 2011 honoree of this very program representing Taft Middle School. So please join me now in a moment of silence. Thank you. There is an African saying, it takes a village to raise a child, that has been mainstreamed in a well-known best-selling book. And it's true, it does take a village to raise a child, and precisely that, because of that, the child, as he or she matures and benefits from that nurturing, has an obligation to the village. It might be in the form of donating time, or money to a charitable organization or just showing a junior member of the village the ropes to a given situation or giving him or her a leg up. So remember that while it takes a village to raise a child, it is the children who sustain the village. Let us pray. Oh, best Heavenly Father, Help us to remember that we are all children of God. 
As children of God, we are blessed with your presence and guidance in our lives. We are also challenged to live up to this blessing by how we take care of and treat each other. Your faithful servant, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., provided us with a roadmap, a roadmap of nonviolence and love that reminds us that we are all accountable to each other. Father, open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts to your will that we may understand how we may best serve you. Give us the strength and compassion to make a difference in the lives of all your children so that your village will be sustained forever. We pray this all today as a dedication and promise to you, Lord, to fill your command of love and nurture one another. And the whole village said, Amen. I do have one more job to do. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you a very special musical group under the direction of Kent Keating. Meister Singers is one of Cedar Rapids Jefferson's most select vocal ensembles. They have performed for regional and national choral directors conventions and locally have performed for the composers festivals clinics and competitions, earning high marks and awards in virtually all cases. In addition to their talents to voices, this group has an average grade point of 3.843. <laughs> In 2010, the Meister Singers were selected as the grand champions of the Concert Choir Division of the North Central Competition in Indianapolis, Indiana. Last spring, the Meister Singers were crowned grand champions again of the Chamber Choir Division at the Hoosier Show Choir Classic held in Indianapolis, Indiana. They were also named grand champions of the Chamber Choir Division at the Chicagoland Showcase Chamber and Show Choir Division contest at Arlington Heights, Illinois. So please, all of us, please stand at this time and join with the Meister Singers as they perform and we sing the African American National Anthem. You'll find the words on page three of your program with you. Lift every
Good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Daniels. I am owner of iBest Solutions here in Cedar Rapids, a financial service and insurance company. I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker this afternoon. Have you ever been in a situation where you desperately needed professional help and automatically, while still in panic mode, without blinking an eyelash, knew exactly who to call? That happened to me back in January of 2011. My fraternity, Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, was having their regional meeting which was comprised of approximately 450 African-American men from the upper Midwest on the first week of April. The local alumni chapter and undergraduate chapter at Iowa combined forces to host this event in Eastern Iowa. Since Iowa City, a university town, was the host location, we decided to resurrect an old community service slash educational program. The oratorical contest for junior and senior high school students developed and run by senior members of our fraternity who had since relocated was chosen. This was a great idea. There was a problem though. This program was developed by brothers who were educators. I and others knew how to market the program, but none of us knew all the ins and outs of developing an oratorical program. No worries. I called Dr. White. She gave me all the information I needed to know and instructed me on the best way to reach our goal in the time frame we were dealing with. She even agreed to be our honorary judge. As a person who continually, continually promotes achievement and growth to students, Dr. White received the 2011 Promoting Achievement Award from Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity that weekend. Because of her commitment towards education, her steadfast beliefs in tolerance and diversity, and the love of her community, Dr. White has been recognized and has received awards and honors such as the Zeta Pi Beta Founders Week Excellence in Education Award in 1991, the NAACP Vision Award for Youth Education in 1995, Martin Luther King Holiday Celebration Award in 1996, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Service Community Service Award in 1997, KCRG9 Who Cared nominee in 1998, NAACP Excellence in Education Award in 2001, Outstanding Advanced Placement Teacher on the AP Central College Board in 2002, University of Iowa College of Education Phyllis M. Yeager Commitment to, Ver to Diversity Award in 2002, the NAACP Viola Gibson Award in 2006, the Women's Equality Day Woman of the Year Award in 2007, and the African American Women's Conference History Makers Award recipient in 2008. Dr. White has 30 years of experience as an educator in the Cedar Rapids Community School District. When I heard she had retired, I thought she would move somewhere and we would lose another valuable part of our community. She didn't. Instead, Dr. White developed the Academy for Scholastic and Personal Success and currently serves as its executive director. She has worked on the Commission on the Status of African Americans at the Iowa Department of Human Rights and was appointed Director of the Iowa Department of Human Rights from 2003 
through 2004. Dr. White has served on the board of directors for the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission, Diversity Focus, the Greater Cedar Rapids Community Foundation, the Cedar Rapids YMCA Family Service Agency, the Cedar Rapids Arts Center, and the Cedar Rapids Fine Arts Council and many other organizations in various capacities. Currently, besides being executive, executive director for the Academy, Dr. White is program director for Kids on Course, a collaboration of the Zach Johnson Foundation, Cedar Rapids Community School District, and United Way of East Central Iowa. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present my soror, Dr. Ruth White. Thank you, Dwayne. That was quite a lengthy introduction. <laughs> I've been told I only have a few minutes to talk, so I have to subtract those minutes. <laughs> uh, thank you to United Way for selecting me to speak to you today, to Rotary for putting on this wonderful event. Thanks, hi, hey, hello to everybody in the audience that I know or whose paths have crossed mine over the years. I'm tempted to say, if you went to Washington High School ever since 1982, raise your hand. See? I could do that for some other things too, but time is, is passing. Um, I would like to, uh, before I get started, acknowledge uh, Mrs. Iowa International, LaSheila Yates, also a colleague of mine, who will, as part of her platform, be conducting outreach through the state to promote STEM uh, initiatives. She's back in the back. Also, a uh, shout out to the Kids on Course team over there. <laughs> to George, my husband. <laughs> and to Travel, my grandson. told him I was going to mention his name. <laughs> uh, also, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Meister Singers. I don't, I guess they're back someplace, but I would, um, I would just like to say that I think that James Weldon Johnson and Rosamond Johnson, who wrote the words and music for the African American National Anthem would have approved of that rendition and that arrangement. It was beautiful. And if you don't know the words to that song, you should learn them. They're, they are beautiful. Um, where are the honorees? Are you over kind of in this area? Okay, I will be directing some comments to you. Um, as an English teacher, I always think, well, maybe I should have a test. And so, if time permits, there's going to be a test. And if it doesn't permit, then the students, I will ask you to um, take this test in the section of the program that follows this one. So, um, and all of you can look and listen for references to four literary works with, uh, if you're, with, with which, if you're not familiar, you should be. So I would have you have your pens and papers out if I, you were in my class, but. Right now, I'll just ask if you're ready. I'm really, really, really pleased, privileged, and proud to have the opportunity to speak to you on this historic occasion, Martin Luther King Day and Inauguration Day. This is a moment in history. President Obama, I think, has already taken the oath of office um, as of now. Dr. Benson and I were comparing notes. I stayed in the car until um, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. He stayed in the car until Vice President Biden, and I think Dwayne 
stayed home until the whole thing was over. <laughs> so we'll have to hear that later on. Um, I, I am full. I am proud to be standing here at this moment on this day, speaking on this occasion at this time in history. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field, frozen with snow. Langston Hughes is telling us that if we compromise our dreams, it will be difficult to live to our fullest capacities. We will be unable to fly. A broken winged bird is crippled and not likely to survive. Just as we, if we capitulate to less than we are capable of, will live a less than vibrant or barren life. In that same cycle of poems, dream variations, Hughes asks what happens to a dream deferred. His specific reference here is to the plight of African Americans whose dreams or whose opportunity to dream has been stunted by the historic reluctance to accept us as full citizens. The poem finally asks whether dreams deferred for too long explode. Dr. King had a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. And although Dr. Dreams, Dr. King's dreams were deferred by the very explosion, the Hughes poem prophesies, his ultimate sacrifice made it possible for more of us who survive to dream and to realize our dreams. I stand before you as the daughter of James Milton Trotter and Florence Bell Thomas Trotter. I honor my parents now as I did when I was a child. I believe that my brother, sister, and I were well raised by parents whose dream was that of most parents to provide a better life for their children than they, especially my father, had growing up. It's interesting to think of my father's struggle within the framework of the history of the time. As a child growing up in Rantoul, Illinois, I did not have the capability to formulate a historic framework because there was no glimmer of my heritage reflected in what I had been taught in school. I can now appreciate the courage that it took for my father to accomplish all that was his life. He was born in Millersburg, Kentucky. He was shunted from family member to family member as a child because his father was, in the parlance of our family lore, a ne'er-do-well, read, drinker. And his mother, whom he loved, died young of tuberculosis. Between Millersburg, Detroit, and Dayton, Ohio, my father somehow had the grit to graduate from high school and matriculate at the Ohio State University in fits and starts for 12 years, stopping to work to earn enough money to continue until he earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry. He married my mother while he was still a student. We have pictures of him holding my sister in his graduation gown. This was early in the last century when history books may tell you that Jim Crow was raging and will tell you that World War I had begun and ended and that our nation suffered a Great Depression. Because working in a munitions plant during World War II did not constitute a career, he took what must have been a daunting step and moved his wife and three children, which by then included my brother and me, to Rantoul, Illinois where there were no black people, to work in the pharmacy at Chanute Air Force Base. His dream of being a pharmacist in his own store was deferred by the laws that prohibited him as a black man from entering into that enterprise. He was not cowed by that rejection, however, and persevered until he became chief pharmacy officer of the Chanute Air Force Base Pharmacy. In a very real sense, he achieved his dream. There's a lot to tell about growing up in Rantoul. For the most part, my childhood was idyllic, primarily because my family was so solid. My father became chief pharmacy officer at Chanute, although he was not military, an exceptional accomplishment. He was highly respected by the pharmacy guys, that's what we call them, his pharmacy guys, who called him Mr. T. My mother did not have to work, so she was a real cleaver mom. She was a room mother, Cub Scout, Boy Scout, Brownie, Girl Scout leader, and she put me in dance when I was seven. I have a clear memory of her telling Patricia Funk, 
the dance teacher, that she expected me, the only black child in any of the classes, to be treated well. I understand the trials of their raising us now that I know my history. There was no housing for the first black family in Rantoul. So my dad had to prevail upon the general at Chinook, General Gates, who allowed us to live in military housing, both on and off base, until a new development of tracked homes was built and we were somehow allowed to buy there. From the perspective of history, I now realize that discrimination was rampant. It had kept my dad from owning or renting land in Rantoul when I was a child, just as it had when he dreamt of owning that drugstore in Columbus after he graduated from college. It created the necessity for my genteel mother to be a tiger mom, to protect us while we were growing up. It kept us from getting summer jobs, from hanging out at People's Cafe after games, and from going to the new swimming pool. My parents knew about post-World War II housing discrimination, about Emmett Till, about Rosa Parks, E. Franklin Frazier, Kenneth Clark, and Martin Luther King. When we kids were only dimly aware, it is only through the lens of history that I can put that into some perspective. That history is my life. I realize that who and what I am is informed by the fact that I am an African-American woman. If I honor that, I will be honoring what Dr. King dreamt of, stood for, fought and died for. I believe that honoring heritage is necessary for everyone. This embrace of heritage and legacy, even though the idea is rejected by people who think that ethnicity and heritage and history are irrelevant in this day and age. I was not a civil rights baby. I was young and aware, if not fully conscious, when Dr. King was assassinated. As remote as that history may be for so many of you, it is what I have lived. From the perspective of history, I realize that our forward movement as a society has obliterated the dreams that so many of our leaders held fast. Do you remember where you, where you were when John F. Kennedy was assassinated? I do. It was November 22, 1965. Do you remember the assassination of Malcolm X? I do. It was February 21, 1965. Of course I remember the assassination of Dr. King on April 4, 1968, which when I told, was giving this speech to my grandson, he lasted about four minutes into it. Um, <laughs> He reminded me that that is two days before his birthday. Robert Kennedy, June 6th, 1968, two days after my birthday. NAACP Field Secretary Medgar Evers was also among the casualties of that year. And I was on Michigan Avenue when Chicago police and demonstrators clashed during the 1968 Democratic Convention in August of that year. I did not demonstrate in the streets. I did not wear an afro or a dashiki. I can't remember using the black power sign, but I remember when Tommy Smith and John Carlos were expelled from the 1968 Olympic Games for raising black gloved fists and bowing their heads during the playing of the national anthem at their medal ceremony. 1968 was a stormy year during which many American cities burned in protest over civil rights, poverty, Vietnam, racial inequities, you name it. You didn't have to be aware. You just had to be alive to be impacted by it. It was a time out of time. There was unrest everywhere. We were all shocked and saddened by the assassination of President Kennedy in 1965. Three years later, when our civil rights leader was slain, against the backdrop of the violence of the civil rights movement, the reaction was anger. <clears throat> I was in Jefferson City, Missouri on April 4, 1968, and vividly recall the riots that broke out across on the campus of Lincoln University. Our, our apartment was right across the street from the campus, and I literally hid, hid behind the couch, hoping that the flames would skip the business below our apartment. I suppose it may have been an unintended consequence of that horrible time that led us indirectly to Cedar Rapids because 
We were hired away from Gary, Indiana, where I first taught, to become firefighters in Kankakee, Illinois, in the wake of the civil rights upheaval. And from there, to Cedar Rapids to accomplish the same sort of purpose in 1972, although the language was softer. We understood that we were sought after because of our ability to navigate in two societies, one black and one white. We were experienced educators, qualified in every sense, and brought the added bonus of having lived around white people. We came to Cedar Rapids because the then superintendent needed to increase the number of African American professionals in the school district, and this is still an issue. We were perceived as being able to relate to our own people as well as to negotiate the larger society. We had lived it all our lives, but this move reinforced in us the need to be cognizant of what W.E.B. Du Bois called double consciousness. In the souls of black folk, he said, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others. The Negro ever feels his two-ness, an American and a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideas in one dark body. Du Bois, a PhD and professor of sociology at Atlanta University, was aware of just how profound a concept that is. He spent much of his life wrangling with it and articulated it beautifully in that work. The idea of double consciousness suggests the necessity to span two societies. Du Bois posits that double consciousness requires African Americans to view themselves from their own unique perspective and at the same time view themselves from the perspective of the outside world through the eyes of others. One must be comfortable enough in one's own skin to know who he or she is, and then be fluent enough in the mores of the other society to be viewed as acceptable by it. It's a tricky road to travel because one can, and you can see examples of it right now, one can lose oneself in the attempt to be ingratiated by the larger society even though one is othered by it. More often than not, it means you have to look a certain way, speak a certain way, and act a certain way in order to be accepted, and that it is those very traits which, if they are not part of one's indigenous self, can lead one to one's becoming lost to and from the very society that nurtured it. Creating an element of conflict between the African American and the larger society, and at the same time creating a conflict within the African American as relates to his own culture and society. I bring this up because the concept of double consciousness became manifest in my own life. I thank heaven for the wisdom of my parents who saw the dangers of raising black children in a white town and provided us what we needed to survive. Books, rules, mandates, a black church 15 miles away words to live by, and lots and lots of love. When we came to Cedar Rapids, I kept finding myself in places where I was the minority and was expected to teach others how to deal with people who look like me. I was the other in Rantoul, and I was expected to teach it in Kankakee and then in Cedar Rapids. I had been looking for myself in the literature that I loved and excelled at studying but not finding myself there. Not in elementary school, not in high school, not in college. With the notable exceptions of George Washington Carver in elementary school and Ralph Ellison in college. Then when I was studying for my masters and doing research on the playwright Eugene O'Neill, every resource I encountered contained citations by Darwin Turner. Turns out Darwin Turner was a professor at the University of Iowa. My association with Dr. Turner was the beginning of my PhD study and also of my self-awareness. I discovered that my culture was rife with scholarship and that I just didn't know it. I was and am a reader and our house was full of books. I can remember getting out of having to set the table because Ruthie is reading. But what I discovered in the literature that I had never known existed to read 
and in the history that I had never been taught, filled me with a pride and confidence that augmented that which came from being a part of my family. It provided a foundation that gave me strength. It was a literal aha moment. And I have been on a tear ever since. I saw the need to introduce the importance of cultural knowledge in the students I taught, to encourage young people to get in touch with their history, their culture, their heritage, to embrace their heritage instead of ignoring it or rejecting it altogether, and to use it to garner the strength to achieve. Students who did not know or did not see the importance of learning about their culture were often wasting their time in school. And when they realized that there were many, many, many examples of people who had persevered against odds that were so much greater than what they faced, they were energized to do better. So when I got the chance to teach humanities and advanced placement English, I often diverted from the prescribed curriculum and taught works by minorities. She can tell you. I made assignments that required all of my students to delve into their histories and to discover things about themselves. As academic advisor to minority students, I was able to learn more about different cultures from the students who came from various places around the world and to innovate ways for them to share their cultures with their peers and teachers at Washington High School. We often forget that dreams begin in childhood and that icons were once children too. We sometimes overlook the influence of family and education in those incarnations. Martin Luther King Jr., Nobel Peace Prize laureate, civil rights leader, minister, orator, and intellectual, was also once a boy who had a father, mother, and two siblings. Education was a priority. His father was a powerful minister, and so was his mother. Martin King was a precocious child who questioned. Dr. King, as Martin King, said, it is quite easy for me to think of a God of love because I grew up in a family where love was central and where lovely relationships were ever present. It is quite easy for me to think of the universe as basically friendly, mainly because of my uplifting, hereditary, heredity and environment. It is quite easy for me to learn more about, uh, more toward, op lean more toward optimism than pessimism about human nature, mainly because of my childhood experiences. But when Martin King was only a boy, he experienced the kind of discrimination that would inform the civil rights work of his adulthood. Suddenly being prohibited from playing with white, the white neighbor whom he'd lived next door to for years, having to move to the back of the store to try on shoes, being stopped by the police while driving with his father and hearing the police officer refer to his father as a boy. This was a man who had to know the beauty of his culture and to embrace himself in it in order to do the work he did. How else could he have had the strength to support Rosa Parks, to lead countless marches, to go to jail, to place himself in harm's way countless times and still preach messages of love, compassion, and forgiveness? He surrounded himself with like-minded people and kept his eye on the prize. I was asked to tell my story. My story is as much, is much about family and education as anything. And if you have a family, nuclear or otherwise, and education, you can reach any height, endure anything. When I've been tempted to throw in the towel, whether because of challenges in earning my degrees or challenges in learning the dance steps to river dance for a theatrical production, I remember the lessons of perseverance my father taught by example and push on. Because what my dad went through was endured to some degree by all people of color. While I am in no way arrogant enough to compare my upbringing to Dr. King's, I believe that Dr. King's life was also to a great degree in founded on family and education. His father was a major influence of the junior Dr. King becoming a minister. I guess the influence of my father, he said, also had a great deal to do with my going into the ministry. This is not to say that he ever spoke to me in terms of being a minister, but that my admiration for him was the great moving factor. He set forth a whole noble example that I didn't mind following. Both of these fathers, Dr. King and mine, were stern taskmasters. Good grades were expected in our homes. 
I didn't skip two grades like the young Martin King did, and I wasn't 15 when I went to college like he was when he entered Morehouse, but I was 12 when I decided I was going to somebody's college. A job wasn't done unless it was well done. You didn't stop until it was finished. Dr. King sent his son to work in the cotton fields so that he would have a healthier respect for his forefathers. We lived in Illinois, so there were no cotton fields. But when I discovered that detasseling was the worst job ever, <laughs> my, my father made me finish the season. Heat, bugs, blisters, and nasty stuff on the tassels, notwithstanding, because he believed that once you started a thing, you finished it. These are lessons that built character because they were hard. They provided a foundation. So what does all this have to do with you, young people? who are being honored here today because you have embraced the legacy of Dr. King. You're doing the right thing. Keep on. Work hard, dream big. Know that there will be bumps on the road, but also know that you can overcome any obstacle if you have the love, support, and guidance of family and the willingness to work for a good education. These are things I learned from my father and mother and that we are passing, and we are passing that legacy on to my grandson. Know yourself. If you know who you are, then you can stand strong in that knowledge. When in Shakespeare's Hamlet, Polonius told his son Octavius, to thine own self be true, and then it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man, he could well have been talking to you. Wrap the veil of knowledge around yourselves and take comfort in the fact that you are a unique individual, not other, not different, but you. There is infinite strength in that kind of knowledge. Be aware of what is going on around you. History is happening every day. Today is a good example. Use it to grow. But also know that the struggle that Dr. King died for is not over. There remained much work to do. Dr. King's dream that we all be viewed as equal, that people be judged by their character, and not by what they look like, has seen progress, but has not come to fruition. There is still too much violence, too much injustice, too much oppression, too much poverty. There are still too many broken-winged birds. When we all have equal opportunities to dream and achieve our dreams, when we realize that we are no better than the least of these, when it is re unremarkable that our president is black or Latino, or that there are 20 women in Congress. When I no longer feel the need to scan a room to see who else in it is black or brown, or when a room is more than half full of black or brown professionals, and that is unremarkable to you, then we will be on the way to fulfilling Dr. King's dream. So you, as young, a young, clear-eyed generation must continue Dr. King's mission. You must become drum majors for justice. You must keep your eyes on the prize and carry on with the good work that you have begun so young so that his living will not have been in vain. Dream big, work hard, be nice. It's been an honor to speak to you today and remember Hold fast to dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> Trying to put together a couple of thoughts from some of the things that she was talking about. As a 1974 graduate of Washington High School, I remember those years. I remember the things that we went through. When I was in elementary school and we had Dr. Harris move in down the street from us, or actually through the woods, and I spent time in his home and his children spent time in our home. I grew up not seeing the differences 
and I appreciate my parents now for some of the things that they stood for. Before we get too far, I want to put a point out a couple of things. I want to thank the sponsors for today's events. You've seen them on the list. Um, if, you, if you see a name up there, please, and you see someone in the audience, please thank them for, for their sponsorship. Those are the things that allow us to do things like this. Special thanks, Do, uh, Barbara Edom, Elam, who started this. The committee will give thanks to after the program. Now it is time for our honorees. I want to thank you everyone for joining us here today to recognize the 22 student leaders who demonstrate Dr. King's honorable characteristics through volunteer work, school attendance, and positive behavior. This is what we wait for to congratulate these wonderful young people who are part of our community. Each of these students, and they're coming forward and they know where they're supposed to have a little tape where they're supposed to stand. Each of these students was nominated by a school administrator or a faculty member. I'm going to take, it'll take a couple minutes to get them all up here. Dr. Uh, Bens Dave Benson, Dr. White. Dr. Benson, by the way, is also a Rotarian in town is going to come up on stage to help congratulate the students. And with that, we'll take my question. Jasmine Allen from Metro High School. Jasmine displays the leadership qualities of adhering to a goal and acceptance of those around her. Jasmine is welcoming of those newcomers and shows great empathy toward them because she was once herself a newcomer. She shows a confidence that can lift others who are in her presence. It's clear that she wants to make school and the world a better place by demonstrating how positive things can be. She believes in the words, tomorrow's dream is just a night away. Congratulations, Jasmine. <laughs> Brian Banowitz from Xavier High School. Brian's motto is a quote from Billy Joel. I think music in itself is healing. It's an explosive expression of humanity. It's something we are all touched by. No matter what culture we're from, everyone loves music. Music has been a very important part of Brian's life, and he feels that this quote speaks of acceptance, and it is a common language among everyone. You learn about what it means to be a part of the big symphony of life, each part intertwining to become the most beautiful piece of music ever composed. Congratulations, Brian. <laughs> Hannah Borse from Roosevelt Middle School. Hannah's motto is something her parents said. If you believe in yourself, you can make yourself whatever you want to be. This quote describes how she lives her life because if she puts her mind to it, she can achieve all her goals in life. Congratulations, Hannah. Jacqueline Brock from St. Joseph Catholic School. The Darren Hardy quote that best describes the way Jackie lives her life is, giving to others is the greatest gift you can give yourself. This quote speaks to her because the feeling you get when you give is greater than any gift you will ever receive. Even just giving a little of what you have creates a feeling of motivation that will push you to give more. Money is not the only thing you can give though. Time and volunteer work can sometimes be even more valuable and rewarding. Congratulations, Jackie. <laughs> Bailey Bruce from Vernon Middle School. Bailey's motto is, the past can hurt, but you can either run from it or learn from it. Congratulations, Bailey. <laughs> Lena Burrell from Linmar High School. Elena's motto is, he prayed, it wasn't my religion. He ate, it wasn't what I ate. He spoke, it wasn't my language. He dressed, it wasn't what I wore. He took my hand, it wasn't the color of mine. But when he laughed, it was how I laughed. And when he cried, it was how I cried. To Lena, this means that everyone is different in their own way. But at the end of the day, we are all equal and should be treated as such. Congratulations, Lena. 
Jeffrey Chambers Jr. from Cedar Rapids Washington High School. Jeffrey's motto is, when obstacles arise, you change your direction to reach your goal. You do not change your decision to get there. Jeffrey overcame abuse from his father, which has made him find other ways to maintain good grades and happiness in his life. Congratulations, Jeffrey. <laughs> Nick Connolly from Marion High School. Nick's motto, don't waste today when there is no certainty in tomorrow. This quote describes his life because he has strongly grasped the concept that life is short and the time we have left is going by fast. He wants to be able to proudly say that he lived his life to the best of his ability, taking advantage of every opportunity given to him. Congratulations, Nick. <laughs> Dalvin Dixon from Kennedy High School. Dalvin's motto, boom, it says so much and it's only a single word. One of his favorite activities is providing less fortunate families with Christmas gifts. He has volunteered to ring the bell for the Salvation Army, participated in sleep out for the homeless night, assisted with the Special Olympics, raked leaves for the elderly, spent time with people in a retirement home, and much more. Congratulations, Dalvin. Avery Guy from Taft Middle School. Avery's motto is a quote from Dr. Seuss. Be who you are and say what you feel because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. She lives by this because it reminds her that she can be anything she wants to without people trying to put her down. She can dress, talk, and act the way she wants because her family and true friends will love her for who she is. Congratulations, Avery. Spencer Henningsen from McKinley Middle School. Spencer has two mottos that are important to him. My parents have always told me and my brother, be kind and be good at what you do and you will succeed. The other quote he admires and tries to live by is, never look down on anybody unless you are helping them up by Jesse Jackson. Spencer lives by both of these. Congratulations, Spencer. Bona in from Oak Ridge Middle School. Bona has two quotes. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. To her, this is about accepting life as it comes. Her other quote by Oscar Wilde. To live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people just exist. These two quotes remind her to live her life to the fullest and enjoy each day for what it brings. Congratulations, Bona. Raven Johnson from Jefferson High School. Raven's motto is the golden rule. Treat others the way you'd want to be treated, with kindness and respect. This is how he lives his own life. Congratulations, Raven. Kelsey Levi from Prairie Point Middle School. Kelsey's motto is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. She likes to be the cheerful, excited person in the group. She believes a good attitude is vital for success. When you're optimistic, there's little that can pull you down or hold you back in your endeavors. Congratulations, Kelsey. Austin Moss from Harding Middle School. Austin leads by example through his positive attitude and dedication to his education. He works diligently to reflect the pride at Harding and continually works to improve his skills as a leader. Congratulations, Austin. <laughs> Connor Miller from LaSalle Middle School. Connor's motto is a quote from Colin Ford. What you do is a matter of what you will do. Congratulations, Connor. Taylor Peterson from Prairie High School. Taylor's motto is always give people the benefit of the doubt because you never know what impact you can make with a little help. Congratulations, Taylor. <laughs> Lucretia Pledge from Franklin Middle School. 
Lucretia's motto is cherish each and every moment you have now because there may not be another moment. She lives by this because she knows not to let life pass her by. Congratulations, Lucretia. <laughs> Faith Saturn from Regis Middle School. The quote that best describes how Faith lives her life is from St. Francis of Assisi. Start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. She loves this quote because she enjoys being involved in just about everything. She doesn't know how she does it sometimes, but she doesn't really think it's her doing it. She thinks it's God working through all the people she knows, mostly her family. Congratulations, Faith. <laughs> Aaliyah Watkins from Wilson Middle School. Aaliyah is a natural leader. She has a strong sense about what is right and wrong and chooses to live by what is right. In her words, there's no next time. It's now or never. Congratulations, Aaliyah. Andrew Wood from Excelsior Middle School. Andrew's motto is, attitude is everything. If you don't have a good attitude toward what you're doing, then it will just end up worse. If you're positive, there will be a positive outcome. If you're negative, then expect a negative outcome. Congratulations, Andrew. <laughs> Spencer Zelke from Cedar Valley Christian School. Spencer's motto is YOLO, which stands for you only live once. Spencer says when he lives by this motto, he uses it to push himself to live his life for God. Spencer believes in God, that he is his creator and died on the cross to wash away his sins. He tries to live every part of his life to reflect God. He makes mistakes, but everyone does. He tries to eliminate as many of these as he can. That's just who he is. YOLO! Congratulations, Spencer! Will the students please stand once again? Let's give them our thanks. I think each of us in the audience and the students need to remember that we need to dream big and that each of us has a baton that we're carrying through our lifetime. It's not where you came from, but where you go and what you can get, how you get there. Once again, I want to thank the sponsors for today's events. I want to thank the committee. Would everyone that's on the, the committee for the luncheon today please stand so we can recognize you? And of course, Barbara, for 27 years ago, starting the whole thing. <laughs> Rotary meets every Monday at noon at the Masonic Lodge, normally. People, guests are welcome, and I need to remind people that we are always looking for new members. So if you think Rotary might be something that fits into your agenda, Please give us a call. Our, our, we have a website as well, which can be gotten through uh, Google. And with that, Rotary is adjourned. <laughs>